Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The post-PC world has become casual, intimate, and physical. It's everywhere. To address this, let's welcome Mr. Simon Seegers, EVP and General Manager of Processor and Physical IP Divisions at ARM, to speak on the world's gone mobile. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Seegers. Thank you, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be here at Computex, which is, just, is a show that's obviously all about computers and PCs, uh, and has grown up in an industry where PCs have become uh, a valuable part of everyday life for lots of people and a valuable business tool. So my presentation here is entitled The World's Gone Mobile, and you think, well, that's not about PCs and computers. But really what I'm going to talk about is how computing has changed and how mobile technology is influencing computing um, and how that is now pervading our lives in different ways, uh, which we believe are all uh, far for the better uh, and are going to introduce new opportunities for uh, devices, new opportunities for business, and new opportunities for uh, improvements to how people access technology. So I run a number of businesses within ARM. I run our processor business. It's all about building CPUs. Uh, which go into computers, and I run our physical IP business, which is all about how we actually go and manufacture them. Um, and where I spend my time is, is getting all those businesses to work together in ARM to make the most optimal solution we possibly can. I'm fortunate enough to have joined ARM at a very early stage of the company. I joined literally a couple of months uh, after the company got going. Um, we are uh, just over 21 years old as a company, uh, which is not that old. And uh, we still consider ourselves a very small company. There's only about 2,000, just over 2,000 employees. Now, in the 21 years of ARM, we've seen a huge transformation in the way computing is done and the way that communication is done. When I joined, nobody in the company actually had a cell phone. Now, that seems quite surprising today, given that most of the people on the planet have a cell phone these days, in some cases, uh, numerous of them. But at the time, none of us did. The company wasn't actually set up to build chips for cell phones. Uh, that kind of came as a, a convenient side effect uh, of the attributes our technology had of being uh, low power um, and being able to be integrated into SOCs. So during the, the 21 years of ARM, we've seen a, a huge transformation in devices. Phones have gone from being very large with uh, talk time measured in minutes. Uh, the, the phone there shown um, on the screen um, I have one in my office, it's great, I bought it on eBay one day, and it's so big, it has the instructions for how to use it printed on the inside of the case. So if you forget what to do, you just take the battery off and you can remind yourself to put it back together. Big machine, uh, and a, a real uh, transformational device uh, for, for the industry and for technology. Computers have, have also tra uh, changed a lot in the 21 years of ARM. They've gone from being you know, really big boxes sitting on desks to being smaller boxes that essentially do the same thing. But what's really interesting is how the evolution of these technologies have come together and created new form factors of device, new types of device, which are really bringing together communication and computing um, in lots of different ways. And it's allowing people to connect in different ways and, and ways we weren't even thinking about, obviously, back in, uh, back in 1990 when the company got formed. Computing has changed really from something that you do, you sit at your desk and you do some computing, uh, to something that's just with you all the time. And, and in this presentation, we're going to look at um, how that transformation has happened, uh, where we are today, and uh, give some of my thoughts about where that's going for the future. Now, the mobile industry today is huge. Um, when we look at uh, the, the silicon that is created, we look at the services that are operated on devices, the devices themselves, we kind of add that up to a, a trillion dollar industry. And that's an enormous uh, amount of money. And that's obviously why we all turn up to shows like this to look at it, because there's a big business opportunity here, and many, many people are, are driving profitable businesses um, through this industry that's grown up. Now, you know, the, money, the money is great, um, but for, for me, it's, it's what can be achieved with all of this technology that makes it even more beneficial than just the sum of the parts. These technologies have enabled people to communicate in new ways, as I was mentioning. It's changed how people live. It's changed how people have access to technology. Uh, and for uh, their betterment, it's enabling them to use that data uh, and improve their lives. So really, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, even though there is this enormous industry. 
mobile technology and computing is changing how people's lives um, uh, operate day to day and changing them for the better. Now in ARM, we're big believers about partnership. This is how we drive our business. From day one, we knew that ARM was not going to be able to do everything uh, itself. We're a small company. When I joined, there was only 16 people, uh, and we were working in a, in a converted farm barn uh, in the middle of the Cambridge countryside, and there was no way on earth uh, that we were going to be able to uh, do everything ourselves. We had to build a big ecosystem of partners. So we went about finding licensees for our technology to go and build chips based around uh, ARM CPUs, um, and also at the same time, build a big ecosystem of partners to support the technology. What that's achieved uh, is now uh, an ecosystem of, of semiconductor manufacturers, um, of software vendors, uh, of OEMs, all using technology, uh, surrounded by a huge support network. That's led to a very efficient business, um, because the ARM architecture is now used by hundreds of different uh, semiconductor companies in thousands of different devices, and is programmed by tens of thousands of software engineers. And being based around that standard, um, it's, it's led to large efficiencies. Before ARM uh, came into being, if you wanted to build a device that had a CPU in it, uh, you really had to do everything. You were going to have to design your CPU architecture, build software tools, write your own operating system, and put everything together yourself, and you would bear the entire cost of that, and you'd only be able to get that cost back across the devices that you made. With ARM, with ARM's business model, that cost of creating and maintaining a processor architecture is shared across everyone who uses it. And so it becomes very inexpensive for anyone who wants to build a CPU-based uh, system on chip uh, to get access to the technology and access to all the supporting technology needed to make their product successful. So we think this business model has been a very large part of our success. Obviously, we believe our technology is fantastic, um, and it is. But the, the business model around it has also been a really important part uh, of making the technology successful and making it so pervasive as it, is, as it is today. Last year, our semiconductor partners shipped nearly 8 billion chips containing ARM CPUs, um, which makes it one of the you know, most pervasive uh, microprocessor architectures ever. And that's really been driven by this, this partnership of companies that we work through. So our business model is slightly different. What we do is focus on energy efficient microprocessor architectures and then we work with our semiconductor licensees um, to help ensure that that technology can get used. Um, and our partners build all of their technology around our CPU core. Um, that leads to a very scalable business. And our technology itself is also very scalable. We have very high performance CPUs, uh, which uh, can deliver lots and lots of performance. And we have very, very small CPUs, which are much lower in performance, can be but can be built into chips that sell for uh, a very low cost. We have uh, ARM processors in chips that sell for tens of dollars, maybe hundreds of dollars in some cases. And we have ARM processors in chips that sell for as little as, as 30 cents. And these get embedded into microcontrollers uh, that I'll talk about a bit later on. So the technology is very scalable. The business model is very scalable. And what that has resulted in is ultimately choice to anyone who wants to uh, build and buy a device. I'll keep going. <laughs> so again, once upon a time, uh, for a device maker, you would have very limited choice of the, the uh, chips that you could buy to put into your design. What we have today is with many people designing around the ARM architecture, for a device maker, choice for where they go and buy their silicon from. That choice leads to uh, competition, and we believe competition is a good thing. It creates uh, tension uh, amongst those partners in our ecosystem who all cooperate with each other, but also compete. And we think that combination of cooperation, uh, establishing standards and working together to establish those standards, but competing to make sure that we all do the very best thing we can, uh, leads to a great result. It leads to choice for uh, device makers, um, that leads to a greater efficient, uh, efficiency in the business and leads ultimately to a lot of choice to end consumers. Fortunately, mobile devices aren't all the same. Um, that choice that's proliferated through the supply chain um, has led to lots and lots of different uh, end devices that consumers can then choose from. If they want a phone that is really good at taking video, there's one of those available. Really good at graphics, there's one of those available. Lots of different choice to the end consumer uh, enabled through this partnership. 
Now, key to, the, to uh, actually delivering these chips is actually manufacturing. Uh, and we spend a lot of time in ARM, whilst we don't actually build anything, uh, worrying about manufacturing. Our founding CEO said that ARM would manufacture silicon over his dead body. Now, he is still alive, and we aren't doing it, and we aren't going to do it anytime soon. But what we do do instead is work with uh, the leading foundries who are creating advanced technology. And many of those are obviously here in Taiwan, because Taiwan has really been uh, a key ingredient of the fabulous semiconductor industry. So I come to Taiwan regularly, um, go and visit the foundries, we talk about uh, technology, and part of my team's job is to make sure that that technology uh, can be used to build ARM CPUs that are as uh, high performance as possible with as low power as possible. Now at any moment in time, uh, one generation of process technology is in manufacture, another one is being developed, and the next one is, is an R&D project uh, which will come to fruition many years down the road. And so we have engagements at all of these points in time. Our customers today are shipping chips in uh, 28 and 32 nanometer at the leading edge. Uh, we are working on 20 nanometer to understand when that technology comes to market, when that technology goes to, to mass market, and what that will mean for an ARM CPU. And then we're starting to look at 14 as well and, and generations beyond that, again, to get that early understanding so that we can make sure that our CPU designs anticipate the physical constraints of manufacturing as early as we possibly can. Now, all of that technology comes together into markets that are growing very, very rapidly. As I said, nearly 8 billion chips last year sold by our partners um, into a variety of markets. Uh, nearly 60% of, of those chips went into mobile applications. And unless you've been on another planet, uh, you kind of missed how this industry and the volumes in the industry has grown enormously. Uh, we have here data from Gartner, um, only out to 2014, but you see uh, the slope of that graph uh, is pretty attractive. If you're in business, you like graphs that look like that, up and to the right. And there is really no sign that the growth in the mobile sector is going to slow down uh, anytime soon. Obviously, I've had lots of questions this week about the, the state of the world economy, and there are ups and downs, uh, but overall the trend is, is up and to the right. What we're doing in that, what we're seeing is that, uh, that the growth in, in different market segments um, is, is appearing to uh, kind of form itself into different tiers. We have really high performance phones, and, and I live in, in California, where everybody seems to be carrying the latest, greatest phone around with them, and it's easy to get kind of caught up that that is the only thing that matters. But there are other very large markets appearing for phones with different levels of functionality, at different price points, uh, that have different uh, performance and power trade-offs. And so we're seeing uh, the growth of, of low-cost handsets for developing countries being a huge business opportunity uh, for ARM and for ARM's partners. Tablets and, and mobile PCs is another big growth potential. All of the, the features that make ARM CPUs good for mobile phones are also beneficial for, for tablets, for PCs, and many, many other markets that I'll come to. Um, and so we see a big uh, opportunity there. But what's interesting about this slide is, is how we're, we're seeing this big growth in, in what we call low-cost handsets. Handsets that don't necessarily integrate quad-core CPUs and, and have all the latest uh, bells and whistles of, of video and graphics, but are much simpler, but are able to leverage from all the infrastructure that's been created uh, around the mobile industry. And those, uh, those phones are shipping, starting to ship in big volumes into developing countries, where new applications for those phones are being found. Now, as we put the data together for this uh, presentation, I was surprised to learn about, about how large a proportion of the world's uh, mobile phone subscriptions are actually in developing countries, over 70%. And mobile phones in developing countries really are changing how uh, people interact with information and with each other for the better. Interestingly, mobile payments are proving to be hugely popular um, in some of the developing countries. There's an example here of um, M-Pesa, uh, which is a scheme allowing SMS messaging to be used for mobile payments, in this case, uh, to allow people to, to uh, fund being transported to hospitals, which is obviously a pretty fundamental thing. If you're sick, you want to get there, and if your relative can pay for you to do that, then that's a great thing. So that's a great example of how life is being improved through modern technology, mobile technology, uh, that's efficiently um, enabling funds to be transfer transferred around. Aquatest is another great example where SMS messaging is being used uh, to transfer information about the quality of water. 
and then centrally that data being pulled together um, and conclusions drawn from it and actions taken. So through a very distributed network of people with low-cost phones, they can gather information and collect that together at a central point uh, for, for the better. Literacy Bridge is another one where in areas where there is very uh, low levels of literacy, talking books are being deployed uh, to distribute information and you know, early days on this, but it seems that uh, the data shows that the education and, and knowledge transfer really is happening and crop yield rates in areas that are using this are improving. So people are learning um, in ways that weren't uh, previously possible through low cost technology coupled with mobile networks. So a great example about how whilst we think about high performance uh, smartphones, accessing mobile um, social networking sites, there are much more other lower level tasks that are being achieved with this technology which are making a lot of people's lives a lot better. So we see ourselves in our, entering this, this post PC era. We, we are in this today. Computers, as I said earlier, used to be things that you sat at a desk and you operated. And PCs really have transformed business. Uh, first company I worked for, if I wanted something printed up, I had to write it with a pen, take it to a secretary who would type it up and print it and give it back to me. Then I'd correct it, then we'd do that again and eventually it would be right. This was so frustrating, I couldn't believe it. Nowadays, of course, you know, nobody would operate a business like that. Everybody has access to a computer on their desk and you do your own secretarial work. At least I do, anyway. And it's clearly common uh, within lots of companies, but it is changing. Um, and the way in which computing is delivered to society is changing, and mobile technology is driving a lot of that. The benefits of being always on, of having different devices for different needs at different times, um, having high data rates into your mobile device in your hand, um, having access to um, different data in different contexts um, is driving uh, changes across society and changes the way that people uh, access information and deal with information. So we think this is a huge trend uh, and a huge opportunity as we go forwards. 21 years in ARM, we've seen big, big changes and I think over the next 21 years we're going to see even bigger changes. Now one area where change is happening is in the workplace. As I said, PCs have, have made a big difference to uh, productivity. Um, but the way in which people use computing in the workplace is changing. With the advent of, of smartphones and tablets, people are finding that these devices have such high utility and such benefits over a machine that is chained to the wall for both electricity and data um, that people are um, forcing their, their companies to, to adopt uh, different styles of device. So we're seeing um, uh, laptops being traded in for tablets in big numbers because tablets in a lot of, lot of cases are really, really useful devices for accessing data, for viewing data. Um, a tablet in many cases is all you need for doing email, just processing and deleting stuff that you'd rather have not received in the first place. Tablets, fantastic device for that. So tablets are becoming, having huge utility in the workplace and we're seeing them being uh, up updated, uh, uptaken in large numbers. And CIOs are responding to that. You know, this is a trend that you cannot stop. Um, the, the tablets, the mobile devices provide such great utility that there is no point in standing in the way of that. And so CIOs are changing their infrastructure to support mobile devices, to support devices that maybe they didn't buy and they didn't give to, to the employee. Um, and so fixing and working out the security implications, when you can access what data, uh, so that mobile devices can be deployed in large numbers, which is further going to increase the productivity um, of the workforce. Now, mobile phones and the technology that's in mobile phones is driving um, a lot of these changes. Uh, and when we look at the kind of trends uh, going forwards, um, uh, we, we see a, a kind of transition from the technology defining what you can do um, to a case where what you want to do with it is defining what the technology needs to deliver. So instead of um, you know, the, your, your phone just being dictated by, by what could be made, um, the way in which people are using devices really is shaping what is being delivered through the supply chain. And increasingly, what people are doing with devices, it has a kind of social context to it. Whether it's sharing information in the workplace about, you know, say, being at this exhibition, what you've seen, and making sure it goes to the person who you work with, maybe in another country, an important uh, thing to be able to do, and through a mobile device you can do that very quickly. 
or maybe it's sharing information about what's going on in your family with your distributed family around the world. I have family on three continents, and uh, you know, using this technology is very useful for uh, enabling everybody to keep track of what's going on in our family. So usage models are really dictating how mobile devices are, are evolving, um, and then subsequently what they do, what kind of screen you have, what kind of data rates you have in the phone, what kind of applications you're running. And as a result of which, we're getting uh, different types of, of form factors. Um, and I think as we go forward, we'll see many, many different form factors as, as tablets and clamshell devices all start to uh, continue to, to utilize mobile technology. We will see uh, many different form factors of device. Um, I think over the next 12 months, you know, clamshells are going to be clamshells. Uh, but beyond that, I think we'll start to see uh, different devices driven by entrepreneurial, innovative companies um, which further meet this need. Now, it's not just in the workplace and, and kind of out in the streets where, where computing is changing. Um, in the home, again, we're starting to see computers deployed in different ways, and in ways where you don't realize there is a computer. If you can buy a, a modern uh, washing machine, it has a screen in it, which is driven by some form of microcontroller. Increasingly, uh, there is the need to limit the amount of electricity that this thing uses, limit the amount of water that it uses, and that requires intelligence. Now, fortunately, through the advent of technology and the evolution of technology over the last uh, few decades, it is possible to put uh, more compute power into your washing machine than it took to land uh, a man on the moon. Now, that technology is all there and can be used to make even something like a washing machine more energy efficient, and that's an important theme uh, that I'll come back to. So energy efficiency in electronics, in TVs, switching them off, controlling the backlight, all of this is enabled by computers by microprocessors with a memory system talking to some interface. They are, that is what a computer is at its simplest form, and they are being deployed in different ways because they can be done so in such a cost-effective way through the efficiency of the industry uh, that we've built. Now, another really interesting area uh, for ARM is the Internet of Things. Now, what's the Internet of Things? It's about computers talking to other computers without humans actually being involved in the, in the communication transaction. And this could be, you know, back in the home, it could be your dishwasher talking to your washing machine and telling it not to run the spin cycle because it's about to do something that's going to cause a spike of electricity into the home. So controlling that through intelligence deployed through your house you know, will reduce the amount of electricity that your house consumes. Um, and, and it goes further than that. Smart metering generally is a, is a big theme. Um, intelligence in cars interacting with uh, information that might be gathered from the road about traffic flows, maybe reprogramming your, your satellite navigation on the fly so that you avoid congestion, you avoid accidents, and you get home sooner uh, and more traffic flows. This is what can be enabled by the Internet of Things. Now, there are other examples about just gathering um, heat and humidity information from buildings, uh, all of which can be processed to control energy. So lots of ways in which computers, again, it's a CPU with a memory system and some interface to the outside world. That's a computer. How that can be deployed in lots and lots of different ways, and then the data that's extracted be pulled together. Now, the Internet of Things requires really, really low-cost um, electronics. Um, and we have some, an example here of, of what is being done today to enable the kind of device required for the Internet of Things. What you really need is a, is a CPU you know, embedded within a computer with a memory system and some I.O. You need a sensor to look at what's going on in the outside world, um, and you need some, some energy in a wireless network. Now, ARM's smallest processor has dimensions that are comparable with a human hair. So it is tiny. This is a, a Cortex M0 Plus, which is a, a product we launched recently. Uh, and is roughly you know, 0.1 millimeters squared. So it's about the width of a human hair. It's tiny. What we have on the, the right-hand side of this uh, slide is a system that is being put together uh, by one of our partners, uh, Ambic Semiconductor. They're a startup in Austin. And they are taking the CPU. They're building a computer around it. They're putting a solar cell on the top. And they're putting a battery underneath it. And in com uh, combination of all of those, you have a device for the Internet of Things that is tiny. You can see on the slide there that um, that module, in comparison to an uh, American penny, it is tiny. 
And as small as that, it can then be deployed everywhere. People have been talking for a while about processors, subsystems with wireless networks that are so small they can be embedded in paint and just painted onto the wall of a room. And sensing can be done, self-forming mesh networks can be created, information can be gathered, and then action taken as a result. And we're at a point where that's gone from sounding like science fiction to something that can actually start to happen. So this is technology of today, and it's only going to get smaller, only going to get lower cost, and as a result, get deployed in big, big numbers. So we're really uh, excited by the prospects of the Internet of Things. Now, combining all of that together uh, requires a network. Uh, the Internet of Things is ba basically has, has four components, three of which are shown here. The sensor that's uh, extracting some information from the environment, a wireless network, and, and in, a, in a device that is that small, obviously you kind of have a very high power wireless network, and so data has to hop from node to node to node before it can get out into a, a broader band type of network. And then you need the cloud. Information and data are very different things. Um, and information needs to be extracted from data. We can extract lots of data very easily, but calculating information from it uh, is hard. So that information needs gathering and then sending back to a user, typically on a mobile device. You know, whether it's something telling you that uh, you know, there's a sale on your favorite brand of jeans in a shop because somebody noticed it, or whether it's uh, uh, back to the, the traffic uh, example where uh, satellite navigation in your car is working that out. Data is being gathered, information is being extracted from it, and then delivered back to a consumer so that you can do something. So all of these things come together. All of these things can be built around ARM technology and delivered in a very low-cost, uh, uh, power-effective way. And what this is going to do is change the way in which we, we interact with the wide world. Once all of this technology is there, and it is pretty much there today, um, it can be deployed into lots of things. Um, healthcare monitoring, you know, healthcare delivery, you know, data being able to gather without needing to go all the way to a hospital uh, is going to make, uh, energy, uh, make healthcare uh, delivery more effective. And you know, more practical things, you know, who hasn't gone into a parking lot and wondered, now where was it that I left my car? Now, again, the Internet of Things can help you find that, may even help you find your keys in your house that you left lying around somewhere. The, the possibilities for this are endless. Um, and the, uh, the, the technology is there. And what's going to be challenging is, is all the services, the security issues, uh, and uh, the businesses that come from it. But a big opportunity, and I think over the next uh, uh, 10 years, we're going to see uh, new companies, new industries created around this. <coughs> One of the other areas that this is going to really help with um, is, is making our world a, a bit more of, a, of an efficient place. You know, whilst uh, the population, may be, population growth might be slowing, um, it's becoming a lot more middle class, we're consuming a lot more, and the, the Earth has a finite number of resources. Um, so we're going to have to get much more clever about managing energy through smart metering, managing water, and there are great examples of sensors being deployed so that water only gets put where it's needed, when it's needed, um, and safety. Um, as, the, as, the, as cities get bigger and denser, they get more dangerous. And so being able to sense uh, information to uh, divert accidents becomes a very important thing. And we have examples in, in all of these cases where uh, ARMS partners are building systems uh, to help deliver this. So this technology is going to make our world a better place. And that really is a key part of ARMS' vision. It's very easy for ARM to, to say this, or for any company to say this. We want to make life better for everyone. Sounds really grandiose. Now, ARM is a business. We're a, a company with shareholders, and you know, we're, we're employed to make money on behalf of the owners of the company. Um, but what makes ARM an exciting place to go and work at every day is the feeling that we are actually building this technology and making the world a better place, and we truly believe this. The advances in mobile technology, the way it's been deployed through multiple industries, multiple applications, is changing the way people compute, and it's changing people's lives. I've shown some examples here, we believe, for the better. Now, underlying all of that is efficiency, it is innovation. The world never stays still. You know, we think we've helped contribute to the creation of a very efficient industry, one where many people uh, have low-cost access to technology and can use that to innovate in lots of different ways. That leads to choice for in devices, it leads to choice for consumers, and it leads to um, the adoption of different technologies and the creation of new industries in ways that people who created the technology in the first place weren't even thinking about. That's a key part of, of, uh, of what ARM attempts to do through the creation of this ecosystem. 
Uh, we've been very successful in doing so, in doing that over the last 21 years, and we're going to remain focused on that uh, as we go forwards. So hopefully I've given you some sense here of, of what we think about the post-PC era. It's all about computers, CPUs and memories and the interface to the outside world, but deploying them in lots of different ways. Deploying them through technology that's very power efficient, very low cost, to enable lots of different markets and to enable other people to innovate around the standards that we create. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seagars, for sharing your ideas. Thank you.